All right. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Jennifer Lilliholm from Boris's Trapped Ion Quantum Computing Group at UW, and I'll be here talking about our research. All right. Uh, so first, I've got a brief introduction on ion traps for you, um, followed by my experiment looking at quantum jumps in a parabolic mirror ion trap. We've also started a project looking at remote entanglement between a single trapped ion and a zinc oxide donor defect qubit. Uh, my lab mate Ludmila is here and gave a poster presentation yesterday on her work with efficient, super, efficient sympathetic cooling of mixed species ion chains. And then we also have a 2D trap which has been recently, collect, recently built and is looking at characterizing 2D ion crystals. <clears throat> <clears throat> okay, so the basic ion trap consists of an RF ring and two end cap electrodes. This ring oscillates between positive and negative charge, which then alternates a pushing and pulling force on the ion. Over time, this gives us a time average stable minimum to the electric field where the ion can be caught. The two end cap electrodes contain the ion axially. So when you're doing experiments in an ion trap, it should surprise no one here to learn that we use lasers to drive our transitions to gather our data um, and do these experiments. The most of our experiments are done with barium ions and I have a diagram of our relevant energy transitions here. Uh, we need to laser cool our ions to keep them in the trap. Our cooling transition is this 493 right here. Um, these are also the photons whose fluorescence we will collect to get the data on our experiments. Since, this collected, since these collected photons are our data, light collection is super important. Um, so a trapped ion is going to emit light in every direction, but you only get data from the photons that you collect going to your imaging system. So in most traps, there's just a lens placed here and you collect the light that passes through it, which typically is two to 3% of the solid angle. Um, higher collection efficiencies can occur with high numerical aperture lenses or other fancy systems of mirrors, such as a parabolic mirror. Uh, the advantage of a parabolic mirror is it will collimate light uh, that passes through its focus. Uh, we have a parabolic mirror trap which has a 39% photon collection efficiency, which you can see here. So what we've done to create this is we've deformed this RF ring into a parabolic mirror shape made of a uh, highly polished aluminum. The upper end cap electrode was deformed into a ring to, um, so it won't block our optical access. And then the lower electrode is a needle which we can use to position the ion axially. I have an image of our potential over here. So in this plot, the shape of the mirror would be something like this and the needle is sticking up right there. Our ion will be found about 25 mils away from the tip of that needle. Uh, right here is our minimum where the ion will be caught and then our uh, optical, our photons are collected in this direction. Uh, here you can see what this trap actually looks like. This is our parabolic mirror. It is about the size of the tip of my pinky, so uh, 10 millimeters in diameter at the opening. Our ions are trapped right above that uh, opening in the hole where the needle sticks through. We have slits in the side that allow for laser access to the ion when it is held at that focus. Uh, let's see, uh, this ground plate here acts as our upper bias electrode and then our collection system is off in this direction. And we've got lots of insulation in there to allow us to apply that RF to the parabolic mirror surface. So what do we actually do with this parabolic mirror trap? This is where we're getting into the quantum jumps experiment. So, what is a quantum jump? That's an energy transition. Um, according to the Copenhagen interpretation, these are transitions which, which occur instantaneously and spontaneously um, and are not predicted by the Schrodinger equation. However, work came out last summer by Devere and Menev showing that they could um, tell when these jumps were beginning to occur and then catch or reverse this jump while it was occurring. Uh, we aim to recreate that experiment with a trapped barium ion. So here are the, uh, this diagram should look familiar because it's our favorite transitions in barium. Uh, so we will strongly drive the ion on this transition and then collect the photons that it emits as it goes through that. Um, when we're driving it, we expect to collect 4.6 counts or photon counts per microsecond. 
uh, while that's going, we will also weakly turn on this shelving beam to a dark state. So we're going to be looking at the rate of arrival of our individual photons. When we have a longer than expected period of time between receiving a photon, we'll take that as a sign that a quantum jump has begun to occur. Uh, and then we'll try to catch it. We'll do that by turning off our lasers and then applying a pi over two or three pi over two pulses. So that pi over two pulse would encourage completion to the dark state and that three pi over two would return it back to ground. So if this jump occurs instantaneously, our uh, ion should either be in the ground or excited state. These pi over two pulses would then put it in a 50-50 superposition and our measurement statistics of the final state should be evenly split between the ground and dark state. However, if we were able to predict that a jump is occurring and catch it in the process, we should be able to um, preferentially drive it to the excited or ground state, depending on the pulse that we chose. And this is what Minev and Devere were able to do in their trans, in their transmon with 82% uh, fidelity. All right, other experiments that we're doing with this parabolic mirror ion trap are looking at remote entanglement with a zinc oxide donor defect. So uh, why is this exciting? This is a step towards building a hybrid quantum system. There are many great candidates out there for qubits, all with their own uh, distinct advantages and disadvantages. For example, ions have great coherence times, uh, but aren't super quick for initialization and gate operations. Donor defects, on the other hand, are fast at those. Um, so a hybrid system possibly consisting of ions for memory and these defects for the gates would be better than a system made of just one. So we're going to be looking at using a parabolic mirror ion trap containing a single ytterbium ion for our ion qubit and a zinc oxide donor defect for the other one. So here we have the relevant transitions of our 171 ytterbium ion. We're going to collect the fluorescence along this red transition and excite it along this blue pathway here. The emitted photons will be collected by the parabolic mirror and then fiber coupled with a predicted 32% overall uh, fiber coupling efficiency. Uh, the zinc oxide donor defect um, is a donor defect. So you have your uh, defect in the crystal which can bind with an exciton creating an electron hole pair. This takes the form of, our, of the excited state for that system and then the Zeeman split spin of the electron acts as the ground state. So using those different levels, we can excite and collect the emitted photon. Different types of donors will have slightly different emission frequencies. Uh, we are currently looking at indium donors and zinc oxide, which emit 340 gigahertz above our targeted ytterbium emission. Uh, this gap can be bridged using the DC Stark shift and by containing the zinc oxide defect in an off resonant cavity. Uh, this cavity will also be used to collect our photons, um, but not for very long. We're going to build it within the bad cavity regime so that these emitted photons will be collected, but not remain long enough to re-excite our system. All right. So bulk zinc oxide has a lot of defects in it and we want to isolate just one. Um, having multiple defects is not great for a lot of reasons, uh, partially because it leads to inhomogeneous broadening of our emitted photons, uh, and also because we want to ensure that we're only getting one photon at a time for our entanglement process. So our collaborators in Kaimei Fu's lab are looking at using zinc oxide nanowires uh, advantages of these na nanowires are that they have a smaller volume and thus fewer defects within them. And photons emitted in these nanowires will travel along the axis, axis and then be emitted through either end. So it'll help with the light collection. Here you can see a forest of zinc oxide nanowires grown on a wafer and then a single one removed from that. Uh, so this nanowire is, was recently created by my colleague Maria Vitaniani. Um, they're still working on characterizing what the defect structure within these nanowires is like, but it's thought that there's about 20 defects of a type within a nanowire of this size. So bridging that frequency gap isn't the only issue with entangling these two systems. There's also a significant difference in the temporal profile of the two emitted photons. So the excited state for zinc oxide is only about one, 
only has a lifetime of about one nanosecond, whereas with terbium, it's 8.1 nanoseconds. So here you can see the spontaneous emission from our relevant levels and the profiles of the emitted photons differ greatly. Uh, so if we try to interfere those photons, we won't get a great overlap on our beam splitter and it will decrease our entanglement fidelity. But we can use pulse shaping techniques to alter the temporal shape of the emitted zinc oxide photon. Uh, so I've done some calculations and believe we can get up to 95% overlap in our emitted photon shapes. Uh, so this will be done by, uh, so uh, here we have the temporal shape of our emitted zinc oxide photon and the emitted shape of the ytterbium photon. You can see their overlap here. Uh, X-axis is time in nanoseconds and the vertical axis is arbitrary, scaled so that everything fits. Um, so a more slowly rising and then longer lasting pulse on zinc oxide uh, appears to draw out the shape of that photon so that we can get our um, desired overlap. <clears throat> Once we have our two identical photons, we need to actually go and entangle the systems. This will be done using which path erasure of emitted identical photons. So the um, two exciting lasers will be synchronized and phase locked, then sent to fast AOMs for the pulse shaping. Our pulses will then be sent to the trapped ion and donor defect systems. Uh, where they will go through the process of being excited and emitting a photon, which is then collected and sent to interfere on a beam splitter. Each output of this beam splitter has a photodetector, and the <coughs> detection of a single photon at one of the photodetectors will be taken as a sign of entanglement. Um, so we'll be entangling the state of one system has gone through this transition and the other has not. Switching gears, I will now be talking about Ludmila's work with efficient sympathetic cooling in mixed species ion chains. So Mila, Ludmila is working with a linear harmonic trap, uh, which briefly showed up in Boris's slides. So in this trap, we've uh, got two long rods with an RF applied to them and then two long grounded rods. This creates a potential in the middle that allows linear chains of ions to form. Uh, so you can also trap different species of ions within this chain um, and then sympathetically cool one species by directly laser cooling one and then the emotional coupling between the two different species of ions cools the other one as well. Um, advantages of that would be you could cool your system without needing to interact with your information qubit. So if you have better coupling, you're going to get better sympathetic cooling because their motions are strong, more strongly coupled and a similar mass between your two species will lead to better coupling. We're doing this work with barium and ytterbium ions, which have a mass difference of about 25%. Um, however, altering your trap parameters can also affect this coupling. And so here you can see what I mean by the coupled motion of the system. For example, if you have two ions of different types which are traps, they can be moving together in the trap or opposite of each other. If you have ideal coupling in this system, you'd expect both of those ions to be moving uh, equal amounts as they go through their oscillations. So here we have some numerical simulations of the motion of these different ions within the trap uh, for a chain of barium and deuterium ions. So you can see that the barium ions are moving much more than the, ytter than the ytterbium ions are, uh, but at lower trap aspect ratios, they become better coupled and their motions become more even. So uh, here an experiment was done with two different trap aspect ratios. These are two different sets of data here. The blue dots come from a trap aspect ratio of 5.5 and the black dots for a trap aspect ratio of 2.9. And then each individual dot is a different ordering of these barium and ytterbium ions within the chain. There's two barium ions, two ytterbium ions. You could have barium, barium, ytterbium, ytterbium, barium, ytterbium, ytterbium, barium, so on and so forth for many other uh, orderings. Um, so you can see here that at the uh, higher trap aspect ratio, the ions were hotter. So our vertical axis here is related to temperature and the horizontal is the um, motion of those ions in the chain uh, as calculated by the simulations from the previous slide. <clears throat> 
you can see that the ions were cooler with this lower trap aspect ratio, which is also where the barium ions have increased movement. There's better coupling happening. Um, the takeaway here being that a lower trap aspect ratio leads to better sympathetic cooling of these two different species. All right, now moving on to our 2D ion crystal characterization, which is being worked on by my lab mate, Alex Cato. So uh, why would we want a 2D trap? These 2D traps allow 2D ion crystals to form like this lovely image that I have over here. Uh, advantage of this are, as Boris said earlier, potentially um, easier for scaling of quantum computations. Uh, each ion has more nearest neighbors, so it's easier to entangle it with the motionally with the ions directly beside it. Um, and then these ones have more neighbors, so uh, better scaling there. Um, additionally, 2D simulations are thought to possibly perform better on a 2D ion array. So these experiments are done in a sectored ring trap. So here what's been done is the RF ring has been broken into eight equal segments and the two end caps transformed into rings to allow optical access. Uh, this is what the potential would look like. Here we are looking straight down into the trap where you can see the different electrodes around the sides, all creating this nice uh, circular potential in the middle where the ions get caught. Um, there's strong confinement axially, allowing it to squish these into nice pancake crystals. Here you can see the schematic of the trap itself. This was macro fabricated. Um, the distance here being about one centimeter. Uh, ions are caught within the middle, and then these eight electrodes apply our RF potential. Laser access comes in through slots in the trap structure, and then optical collection occurs perpendicular to the page, which you can see down in that schematic there. Uh, so by playing around with these different sectors, each of which can be individually controlled, we can alter the shape of the trapped ion crystals. For example, changing the voltage on two opposing electrodes can turn this nice 2D trap, 2D crystal into a linear chain of trapped ions um, by applying a voltage difference of 15 volts. You can also change the ion spacing by increasing the squishing potential on the end cap electrodes, um, which potentially may be useful for individual ion addressing in later experiments. So in conclusion, we've got a lot of cool science going on uh, from looking at the time dependent nature of quantum jumps, which has an insight into fundamental quantum mechanics to entanglement between an ion and a donor defect as a step towards a hybrid quantum system. Uh, looking at sympathetic cooling, which allows for laser cooling without disturbing a, a logic qubit and work towards creating 2D ion crystals for uh, 2D simulations. Um, so I've got my lab mates here who are all doing this work. Uh, Ludmila is currently here, as is Boris and myself, and then our uh, collaborators in Ken Mayfu's lab. Thank you. Uh, fantastic talk, thank you very much. Um, how do you, so you, you said that you had particular arrangements of barium and ytterbium, barium and ytterbium. How do you create a particular one of those. You just keep loading until you get the right one? Yep. Uh, right, cool. They form it, then you allow the crystal to melt, and then reform it again. Okay, cool. Okay, and then a quick question. You mentioned the, uh, the catch, and, catch and reverse experiment in the context of the Copenhagen interpretation. Mm -hmm. I have a fun question for you. Do you have a preference on your interpretation of quantum mechanics? Oh, man, no. Don't care? Okay. <laughs> just, thought I, just thought I'd ask. <laughs> we can bring that up during the discussion. <laughs> I also enjoyed your talk very much. I um, had a question of, about the synthetic cooling. Were the results you were showing there, were they axial or transverse or both? Oh, um, can you clarify what you mean by that? Oh, what was uh, axial or transverse? For the, for the set of modes where you show n bars that uh, uh, correspond to the, the axial or transverse vibrations or actually all of them. Yeah. Oh, uh, transverse, I see. And then, and which ones are being cooled and which ones are sympathetic? And oh, the barium is being cooled and then the ytterbium is sympathetically cooled. I see. Is that just a choice of lasers or? Yeah, yeah we have lasers for barium. So. Can I ask one more question? 
uh, I was just interested in the um, uh, uh, the 2D the 2D crystals. I was just wondering uh, uh, how just I don't know if that's a, a easy thing to answer, but how robust is the cooling Doppler cooling with the micro motion, particularly for the ones that go out to the edge? Um, I think it's pretty good. Um, yeah, the laser is able to hit the entire crystal. We haven't been able to load crystals as large as we're hoping to yet. So uh, I guess it depends on how big we're going to get. Um, works fine for a crystal of this size, uh, although you can already see that the outer ions are starting to heat up more than the ones in the middle. So that there's an elongated shape. Um, yeah, but further tests depending on how big crystals we can form there. Okay, thank you. I don't see any. And let's thank the speaker again. Thank you very much. Oh, from there? Oh, okay. Our next speaker is going to be Paul Hedgen from SFU. He's talking about probing the potential of the collection of the ultra temperatures. You want a pointer too? All right, so thank you. I particularly want to extend my thanks to the organizers as well. It's uh, been a very pleasant atmosphere. Excellent dinner last night, lots of enjoyable company. So thank you to all of you for all the hard work. I have. <coughs> so uh, today, um, I'd like to tell you about uh, some of our work, SFU, uh, Iron Trapping Lab, also using a terbium. Um, so looking at a, uh, uh, a prototype phase transition, and so my first slide here is to try and put this in context of Entrap quantum technology, some of which Boris uh, gave us a tutorial on just previously. So for, for Entraps, the quantum technology encompasses quantum computing, so quantum information processing. You could, quantum simulation, you could consider that a subset of that. And then quantum networking, so connecting remotely via photons, for example. Um, and so this uh, prototype transition that I want to tell you about, the structural transition, you can consider a form of, or uh, consider within the context of quantum simulation. Typically, the quantum simulations that you'll see in ion traps consider the spin degree of freedom. So essentially considering individual ions as spins and modeling a quantum magnet, for example. This type of quantum simulation that I want to tell you about really focuses on the phonon degree of freedom. And, and controlling that. And so I'll explain that a little bit later. Uh, it uses all of these handy techniques that have been developed for ion trap quantum technology, both laser, uh, electronic control, uh, to control these degrees of freedom, spin and pho uh, phonon. So <clears throat> this, I've uh, been looking at some lovely ion crystal pictures. So let me take you historically right back to the start here. So in the top, uh, um, left here, so these are some of the earliest ion crystal pictures, are actually alumina, aluminum particles. <coughs> and then going through to here, once, uh, so these are some of the early experiments, it took a little while for laser cooling ultimately to be able to crystallize atomic ions. And so these are actually the, some of the first pictures of crystallized ions. Uh, so uh, barium, actually, and then some here from uh, NIST over here, <clears throat> magnesium, I think. Following some of these early, early demonstrations, there was quite a bit of work actually looking at structural phase transitions in ions. So these have been known for quite a while. 
can see some pictures here of going from linear to zigzag structure. <clears throat> and so in these cases, you can either increase the density of ions and the Coulomb interactions will cause different structures to form. And there's a whole hierarchy of these transitions from linear to zigzag to interwoven helices and then higher orders. So a whole hierarchy of these. So these are done at Doppler cooled temperatures, so not ground state cooled temperatures, and they've been known for quite a while. So there's been renewed interest uh, in looking at these in the last few years, and in particular at the very first one of these transitions, the linear to zigzag transition. So where you go from a linear to either zig or zag state. So this is the, <coughs> yeah, this is the only one of these transitions that is second order in an ideal situation of this whole hierarchy of transitions. Uh, so continuous phase transition where you can have two of these symmetry broken states as you cross the transition. And so some of the interest that derives from considering this transition, theoretical proposals and ultimately experiments that we've been involved with as well as others, I mean, in some sense come from it's easy to work with. It, uh, in terms of quantum simulation, it provides you a system that's really self-assembled. So it's really the Coulomb interactions, you cross this transition that drive the structure. Uh, <clears throat> um, the fact that it, the non-linearity in the field theory, essentially of this transition, uh, leads to some interesting effects that uh, you can study. And the first ones that are actually looked at, uh, our group as well as others, uh, looked at uh, nucleation of topological defects as you quench the transition. So and these are called kinks actually. So and essentially instead of domains of spin up and spin down in a magnet, for a magnet you can think of domains of zig and zag with structural defects between them. They're topological. Uh, so there was actually quite a bit of additional work done by other groups so going beyond that and additional some of our, our own work. Uh, but uh, we got interested after that in uh, asking a simple question, what happens when you consider this situation cooling to the ground state? So it's never been done before. And in particular, we're interested in just answering a very simple question. Could we see superpositions of the symmetry broken states? Uh, is it possible? And what would be the decoherence mechanisms? So, um, <clears throat> I'm gonna tell you, I'll give you some motivation for that, but along the way, some of the things I'll tell you about today really involve looking as we start to study this transition, uh, really essentially got into reevaluating what the nature of this transition is in the ion trap. And, <clears throat> and some of this has been in collaboration with uh, theory collaborator, Hagai Landa in, uh, in France. So, <clears throat> just a little introduction to the linear zigzag transition. So we work in a linear Paul trap, picture you see in the top right here, uh, terbium ions, it's an actual picture of the, uh, <clears throat> the trap. And then to drive this transition, uh, rather than density, we use, we change the confinement of the potential. So uh, you can either, for example, weaken the transverse confinement and go from a tight cigar to a more open trap and you cross energetically from linear structure to more favorably a zigzag structure here. So here's a live version of that uh, where we're considering 50 ion crystals. So <clears throat> sequence of images as we cross a transition, linear and then through to zigzag. It doesn't work quite as well here. There, it works better on the screen here rather than, I guess the casting is an issue. Mm -hmm. Anyway, you see the essential features. So uh, any phase transition has an order parameter that's essentially the size of the zigzag structure. Uh, you can see a critical point, it's already quite, quite sharp for 50 ions. So as you uh, cross this critical point, the order parameter grows and in a continuous fashion. <coughs> so uh, here's a, this is a picture actually showing you a phase diagram of this transition where I'm showing you temperature on the vertical axis and this uh, trap asymmetry on the bottom here. And you can cross this transition in two ways, essentially by, so from a classical perspective, that finite temperature, by changing the trap potential that I described to you, and also do it thermally, has yet to be seen actually. <clears throat> but 
particularly what I'm focusing on today is if we go below Doppler temperatures to ground state, across this transition, what, you know, what can we see or how do we understand? <clears throat> so this is to fill you in a little bit on how you uh, think about uh, the transition in the quantum situation. <clears throat> so uh, the essential idea is to think about the mode structure. So this is showing you the eight modes, so just in two dimensions, or actually uh, for four ions, be 3n if it was in 3D. But uh, here you see four axial modes and four transverse modes. And the key point to look at here is you cross the transition. Uh, <clears throat> I've described it in terms of energetics, but in terms of modes, there's an instability that develops in the zigzag mode. In fact, it's, its frequency goes to zero. For that reason, it's called soft mode. That's really, if you want to think about it from a dynamics perspective, what drives the transition is instability in this soft mode here. <clears throat> Close to the transition, uh, it's the dynamics of that soft mode that really dominate the, the dynamics. So you can expand uh, the potential energy close to the critical point in terms of the zigzag mode amplitude. So I'm doing field theory here now. <laughs> in a second, I'll be doing quantum field theory. But so it's very simple, simple potential uh, in terms of this amplitude which now becomes the order parameter, uh, has a quadratic and nonlinear term, quartic term. So it's a standard 2-4 potential. Uh, <clears throat> from another perspective, you might recognize this simple form as giving you a double well. So it's an intrinsic double well in the sense that it comes really just from the internal interactions, Coulomb interactions and trap potential. It's tunable because here the alpha is what we control in terms of the trap potential. So we can go from a linear potential on the linear, or harmonic potential on the linear side, where uh, the average order parameter value is zero. And as you cross to the double well, or cross to the zigzag side, you form a double well, and there's the two symmetry broken states or the two minimum energy states there, the finite order parameter size. So uh, the discussion of this, this actually goes all the way back to a, a proposal by Alex Retzker. That's uh, really what we're building on in terms of my discussion here. So you can take that potential, uh, solve the Schrodinger equation, you get an energy level structure like this, very standard for a second order phase transition. So I'm showing you the two lowest energy levels, uh, reference to the ground state. As you cross the transition, uh, so as you cross the transition, this one uh, um, uh, goes to zero. That, in other words, you have a degeneracy forming between the two lowest states. So just show you some pictures here. So over on the right-hand side, this is the linear side. You have this harmonic potential. You'd have an equally spaced ladder going up here. Uh, as you cross over to the transition, you form this double well. And so you have uh, <clears throat> the nonlinearity causes the, the energy level spacing to vary. Here, this just shows the double well where you've captured the first two bounds or the first two bound states that are just below the energy barrier. In this situation, uh, the spacing here between these levels, if you had a superposition of those two levels, that correspond to a tunneling frequency. <clears throat> and so, just to give you some numbers, the tunneling frequency is low by ion trap frequency standards, three kilohertz, but the point is to show you that it's, it's a, not a terribly small number. So it's potentially something that we could observe. And then as you go very far over to the zigzag side, you form a degeneracy here, the tunneling frequency goes to zero, you become exponentially sensitive to any kind of perturbations. <clears throat> okay, so some, I told you about frequency numbers, let me give you some spatial numbers. Uh, what's the double well spacing in real units? So the spacing, uh, when you form, form these first two states just below the energy barrier here, we can perhaps think about tunneling. <clears throat> um, that's a double well spacing that's somewhere in the range of a couple hundred nanometers. So I've talked about, you know, we want to see superpositions. For example, a ground state here would correspond to a superposition of uh, zig and zag, so that's for three ions, but uh, we like to think about more than that. <clears throat> and so these are 
essentially cat states are jet, uh, the equivalent of their cat Schrodinger cat states are the equivalent of uh, uh, GHZ or generalized uh, uh, bell states, uh, you know, up, 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 plus down, down, down. <clears throat> so, um, but just from the perspective, I like to uh, uh, view these things from an analogy. You could perhaps think about this as a mesoscopic ammonia, particularly when you look at the three ions there. Uh, this zig and zag looks very similar to so, <clears throat> the, the uh, two states of an ammonia molecule. I call it mesoscopic because here the double well spacing is uh, you know, a tenth of a nanometer by comparison. <clears throat> Okay, of course, the frequencies are much lower in our case. We have a number of challenges to be able to construct such a system. <laughs> so uh, in order to be able to consider situations where we're in the ground state or perhaps the ground state for six excited state there, uh, we need ground state cooling across this, when we cross this transition. Uh, very high stability trap potential. I'll tell you about that in a, in a second. <clears throat> uh, and particularly important, uh, we need to control perhaps emotional decoherence, but at least assess uh, whether it makes such superpositions feasible. So um, many of these challenges, but also assessing them, we do with uh, a probe involving spectroscopy. So let me show you that in the next slides here. So we do uh, really all of our measurements with Raman sideband spectroscopy to probe the emotional mode structure. So it's a terbium driving Raman transitions here that when we flip a spin, we also couple to the motion and sidebands can allow us to measure frequencies of that motion. And so this shows one particular mode on the linear side, um, <clears throat> but in fact, there's several of them, several vibrational normal modes. And here you see all of them for four ions in the transverse direction. So center mass mode, the rocking mode, bending, and through to the zigzag mode here. So um, in terms of uh, looking at the spectroscopy, uh, measuring the zigzag mode essentially gives us access to measuring the order parameter properties. So energy level structure, uh, we can perform Raman sideband thermometry, uh, <clears throat> and also doing Ramsey Ramsey sequences, we can assess coherences. Uh, if you remember, it's the trap that we're using to change or cross the transition or quench. And so uh, essentially we can measure also the, uh, the control parameter directly through spectroscopy just by measuring the center of mass frequencies, <clears throat> which is what we're controlling. So not only do we measure order parameter, by looking at the center of mass mode and assess uh, the control parameter. And so it's direct, uh, and directly calibrated through spectroscopy. So the Raman sidebands also allow us to do control. So both initializing to the ground state um, and perhaps some other ideas of coherent control of the order parameter. Okay, so um, in order to reach the ground state, uh, we actually implemented for uh, purposes of simplicity, a new, let me say this, a new kind of cooling in iron traps. It's actually an old type of cooling, Sisyphus cooling, 3D Sisyphus cooling for ions. It's now 30 years old and a workhorse in uh, neutral atom experiments. Uh, but uh, so we're the, we were the first actually to do that for, for ions. Uh, and it turns out to be rather useful. Actually, we use it quite a bit. It's very robust, simple to implement and do it on the time scale of the Doppler cooling. So it doesn't require much time overhead. <clears throat> and here's a picture showing you this. It's a pair of beams of uh, polarization gradient cooling allows us to get, in the case of four ions, all 12 modes within a few milliseconds down to a couple phonons uh, uh, thermal, thermal population. So there's some, uh, this has potential wider utility in other kinds of quantum simulations. And just to point out, I mean, there's other related work in EIT cooling and some recent results of uh, multi-mode Raman, simultaneous Raman sideband cooling from the INQ folks. So I mentioned trap stability. It's actually quite important. In order to be able to cross this transition in a controllable manner, uh, we need to be able to control uh, the trap geometry, and that involves the ratio of both the, uh, the transverse to the axial frequency. So we need to control both of them. Uh, somewhat challenging. 
So there's quite stringent requirements on this and our first uh, um, <coughs> uh, a goal, so I want, uh, it's uh, related to some of the initial experiments we wanted to do related to tunneling, we stipulated 10 ppm, 10 parts per million stability of trap potentials. So it's quite stringent. And particularly when you look at it in context of what the voltages are to make the potential, uh, there's both RF and uh, DC voltages, RF up to a kilovolt, uh, DC voltages in the range of millivolts to volts, and, and applied to both rods and other and end caps. <clears throat> so I won't tell you all that story, just give you a little taste of stabilizing the potential. So um, we stabilize in particular, that's perhaps one of the most challenging ones, the RF potential within the ion trap. So about 700 volts. Uh, it's an active stabilization. There's some passive as well, similar to some things that are done at uh, uh, the JQI in Maryland. And this just shows you how good that oscillator frequency is for say the, uh, the, um, for a single ion basically measuring what the harmonic oscillator frequency is in the transverse direction, measuring transverse trap stability. And so here's Allen deviation for the case where the RF is unlocked and that's just ambient instabilities. Uh, when we lock it, we can really push down, uh, achieve much better stability. So this is measured with Raman sideband spectrum or spectroscopy again. And we achieve, actually, as far as I know, this is uh, the best that's been achieved, or about a factor of two better than the publication, of uh, the original JQI publication. So we're down at a few parts per million, 200 seconds, but if you look over hours, we're tens of 10 parts per million trap stability. So that's enabled us to, really, it's one of the key things to see a, a very sharp transition. So this is just showing you some data here. Uh, points overlaid on the transition, uh, first and second sideband for four ions, <clears throat> uh, going from linear across to the zigzag. Uh, there's a couple of things you can see. Um, uh, uh, the data matches the, uh, or the theory matches the data quite well. Uh, I'll zoom in on this really interesting region here in a second. Uh, the deviations over here of the data from the um, uh, the theory, that's uh, the blue line, it's not particularly important. That's because we're considering the theory is for close to the critical point. And so the green line here is a classical uh, model that uh, works well away from the very close to the critical point and see things match pretty well. So it's quite a sharp transition actually. And uh, just to go back to some of these stability issues, uh, in order to see such a sharp transition, uh, you require good stability, but flip side, you have such a sharp transition that it in some way allows us to see uh, things in a relatively or, or become much more obvious uh, than other ways of seeing that in iron traps. And so one in particular, just give you a couple examples of that, in order to achieve such a sharp transition that doesn't drift, uh, we're sensitive down at the level of uh, being able, or we have to worry about things at the, for example, 10 to 100 part per million level, charging of, uh, charging effects on insulators, patch potentials due to contaminations on the electrodes. And so if, um, on the one hand, there's some fundamental aspects to what I'm telling you about, but from a technical aspect, uh, some of these issues of uh, patch potentials due to absorbates and so on are important issues in quantum computing with trapped ions. And so it's, um, I think that uh, looking at these transitions, they may offer a little, uh, an alternative probe into some of these issues in ion traps. Okay, so the sharp transition actually, let me show you an example of some things we can see. We can see a shift in the critical point. So it's always interesting to see shifts in critical point. Uh, <clears throat> um, it's a little peculiar, however, so we see an upshift of a half percent. So it's really this uh, very stable trap potential and the cooling allows us to see this for the first time. So it's about a half percent effect that's an upshift. Uh, if you were to look back at that uh, phase transition picture that I showed you, uh, um, thermal, thermal excitation would typically suppress the transition. This one's funny, it actually transition happens sooner than you'd expect. The cause of that actually is the 
RFs, the effect of the RF pseudo, uh, the effect of the RF potential on the ions. So uh, <clears throat> the typical theory here uh, just considers the time average pseudo potential of the ions, uh, but there is the RF micromotion in there. And even though the ions, in this case, as they cross the transition, sit along the RF null, <clears throat> the effect of the RF motion is such that uh, it's, they prefer to undergo a transition earlier. So um, in the initial actually paper by uh, uh, Landa, so theory is also some experiment done at Ulm. So they, they call this a, a, a classical analog of the, the micromotion, a classical analog of uh, the Zitterbewegung for the, for the electron. This is, there's nothing quantum mechanical in this, however, just to make a point. <clears throat> anyway, but the point is that, uh, so we can see, we see effects that you often, quite often ignore in ion traps. And the, the value of the shift agrees with simple estimate from theory and uh, so we're looking at getting a little finer measure of the critical point shift compared to theory by looking at the actual trap, uh, the real trap, uh, together with Haggai. Uh, <clears throat> so just to remind you, and I now want to zoom in on the, the close-in transition. Here's that picture I showed you before, the ideal theory with the uh, first, uh, the, the spacing between the first excited state and the ground state going to zero achieving degeneracy between these levels. Here's what the data looks like when you actually take the, the measurements. So you see that actually uh, <clears throat> uh, the data does not go to zero degeneracy. For this particular case, it, uh, it actually turns around. So you never actually achieve the degeneracy there. Just a couple of points here. So it's, the, before I tell you the cause, perhaps you already can guess what it is, but uh, the solid lines here in the open are taken one year apart, so it's something very stable in the trap. Uh, and, and in particular, if you look at the spacing here, that's uh, controlling, controlling our system on the order of uh, below a millivolt, actually, to, to step between those. <clears throat> so 